أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم سهل على محمد ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ثم أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولو أننا نزلنا إليهم الملائكة وكلمهم الموتى وحشرنا عليهم كل شيء قبلا ما كانوا ليؤمنوا إلا أن يشاء الله ولكن أكثرهم يجهلون صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, verse number 111 of Surah Al-An'am, he says, and if we had sent down to them the angels and the dead spoke to them and we gathered together everything in front of them, they would not believe unless God wills, but most of them are of this ignorance. Now this verse is a continuation of the previous verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was speaking about the stubbornness of the Meccans and they had made an implicit re request from the Prophet to produce evidentiary miracles to confirm that he is indeed a Prophet of God that he is connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now in this verse Interestingly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet and even the Muslims who are pressuring the Prophet to respond to this request. So you have these Meccans who are asking the Prophet to produce this laundry list of mu'jizat. And they say that if you produce these miracles, we will believe you, we will submit. So some of the Ashab, some of the companions of the Prophet, they say to Rasulullah that why don't you respond to them? They want you to, to, to produce miracle A, B, and C. Why don't you just do it? So perhaps they can believe and they can join the ranks of the believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala interjects. He says to the Prophet and to the Muslims who are pressuring the Prophet, these Meccans are so stubborn and so rebellious and so close-minded. Allah says, if I send down all of the malaika, not just a single angel, it would be a great miracle if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to allow them to see Jibra'il, for example. Allah says, these people are so stubborn that even if I send down all of the angels, every single one of them, and even if I make the dead speak, imagine witnessing a miracle like that. You go to the cemetery, all of them, they come out of their graves and they speak. Allah says, if I send down the angels, if I make the dead speak to them, and I gather everything in front of them, I respond to all of their, I grant them all of their requests for miracles. Allah says they would still not believe. Allahu Akbar. Imagine, these are the types of people that Rasulullah was dealing with. You think you have a difficult time at work with your colleague. You think you have some friends who are stubborn, who are close-minded. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was sent to guide the most close-minded people, the most stubborn people, people that if Allah were to fill the sky with miracles, they would still reject. So Allah says they will not believe unless God wills, meaning the only way that these people will believe is if Allah strips them of their free will to reject. Allah can compel them, He can coerce them to believe. 
So the only way that these kuffar, these Meccans, will submit and accept Islam is if Allah interferes. He strips them of their free will and he forces them to submit. But most of them are of this ignorance. The ayah ends with, وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَهُمْ يَجْهَلُونَ Now there's a difference of opinion about who is being referred to in this part of the verse. Who are the ones who are being called ignorant? Some commentators, they say it's the, the believers who are pressuring the Prophet to perform these miraculous acts. Allah is telling the believers that you people are ignorant. Most of you are ignorant. You don't know how close-minded, how rebellious these Meccans are. So don't pressure the Prophet. Other scholars say that the pronoun in Akhtarahum, the hum, which is a pronoun, that most of them, the them here refers to the kuffar, meaning most of them are ignorant of the idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is omnipotent, that he can do all things. That these questions indicate a type of spiritual immaturity, that they're actually questioning whether Allah is able to do these things. So there's a difference of opinion as to who this pronoun is referring to. In ayah number 112, يُوحِي بَعْضُهُمْ إِلَىٰ بَعْضٍ زُخْرُفَ الْقَوْلِ غُرُورًا وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكَ مَا فَعَلُوا فَذَرْهُمْ وَمَا يَفْتَرُونَ The ayah says, And thus we have made for every prophet an enemy, devils from mankind and jinn, inspiring to one another decorative speech in delusion. But if your Lord had willed, they would not have done it. So leave them and that which they invent. Now, this verse refers to the opposition that the Holy Prophet faced and the opposition that every single prophet has faced throughout history. You see, brothers and sisters, there is not a single example found throughout history where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dispatches a prophet to guide a community and then everyone accepts and there's no resistance, there's no hostility and there's no opposition. That has happened zero times in the history of prophets. Anytime a prophet is sent, the, that prophet creates enemies. That prophet is opposed. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at first glance, it would seem that Allah is the one who has made these people oppose the prophets. Because the, the ayah says, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَا And thus we have made for every prophet an enemy. Now, this doesn't mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates enemies for the prophets. Or he compels certain groups of a society to resist and to vehemently oppose these prophets. Rather, this is referring to a general rule that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created a system of free will. Everyone has the freedom to choose. And the natural consequence of a world where everyone has free will is that you will have people who will, re who will reach their full potential. And that full potential is either extreme good or extreme evil. So Musa السلام, was opposed by Fir'aun. Ibrahim was opposed by Namrud. Isa السلام, was opposed by some of the Jewish rabbis of his time. When you have free will, naturally there will be people on both sides of the spectrum. In the same way that when you, when you have an exam, when a teacher gives an exam, there are going to be A students and there are going to be F students, D students, you're going to have people on both sides of the spectrum. This is a natural result of a world of ikhtiyar. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He doesn't interfere. It's not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whenever there's opposition, Allah eliminates the opposition straight away. Allah allows Pharaoh to be Pharaoh. He allows Abu Sufyan to be Abu Sufyan. 
Because if Allah were to interfere, we would not be able to witness the merits of the righteous. What makes Musa Musa is that he displayed nobility even with Fir'aun. What makes Rasulullah so great and so noble is that the Holy Prophet was able to display these noble virtues because of people like Abu Jahl and Abu Sufyan. We would never, you would not reach your full potential as a believer if you were not thrown in the ring with wicked people. In the same way, I'll give you the analogy of a boxing match. The only way you can, you know, truly appreciate the skill of someone like Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali in the boxing ring, is if you put him in the ring with someone who is of the same caliber, who is an enemy that can match him. Similarly, the virtues of prophets manifest when they interact and when they deal with some of the most wicked of people. On the day of Ashura, for example, what makes Imam al Hussein salam so great and what allowed him to ascend to the highest levels of spirituality was his ability to maintain his, his humanity and his nobility despite the fact that he was dealing with the most barbaric of people. The sabr comes out when you're put and you're mixed with people of all walks of life. So the ayah says, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَا لِكُلِّ نَبِيٍ عَدُوًا شَيَاطِينَ الْإِنسِ وَالْجِنِ Some of the opponents of the prophets are the devils from among mankind and from among the jinn. يُوحِي بَعْضُهُمْ إِلَىٰ بَعْضٍ زُخْرُفَ الْقَوْلِ غُرُورًا they inspire one another. You see, brothers and sisters, people of Batil, they support each other. They inspire each other. They incite each other. One of the Mufassirin of the Quran, he says that it's interesting that in this ayah, Shayateen al ins are mentioned before Shayateen al jinn, that the devils among mankind are mentioned first and the devils of among the jinn are mentioned second one of the commentators of the quran he says that it's because the devils among jinn are worse than the devils among the devils among mankind are worse than the devils among jinn because we have many duas many verbal formulas that you can recite to repel satanic jinn, yes? You can recite, you know, A'udhu Billahi min shaytan rajim And this is, in many cases, enough to repel the satanic jinn. But is there a verbal formula to repel satanic human beings? There's not. So you find that this is one indication that shayateenul ins, in many cases, can be more evil than and more wicked than the shayateen of jinn. Now, what do they inspire? How do they, how they inspire each other? They inspire each other through zukhruf al qawli ghurura. They inspire one another using decorative speech in delusion. Why does the Quran say? When they whisper to one another, when they suggest to one another, they use zukhruf al qawl, decorative speech. They're inciting each other to commit sin, to oppose the prophets, to abuse the believers, to extinguish the truth. Allah says they inspire each other with, with decorative speech because sin is inherently repulsive it requires beautification because it's inherently ugly you don't need to beautify something that is naturally beautiful hasanat don't need to be beautified because good deeds are naturally beautiful whereas sin sin in its essence is repugnant it's foul and therefore it needs to be beautified 
Why do some people wear makeup? Because they need to cover up the blemishes. If your face was flawless, if it, if, it was, if it was naturally beautiful, there would be no need for you to put on makeup or beautify. You do it because you're covering up blemishes. So Allah says they speak to each other with decorative speech because they need to beautify that which is inherently ugly. There's a hadith from Amir al-Mu'mineen where the Imam actually beautifully summarizes all of the strategies of shaitan. You may think that shaitan has an arsenal of strategies and tactics to deviate people. Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, they all boil down to two things. The Imam alayhi salam, he says, الشيطان موكل به Shaytan has made himself in charge of your misguidance. He has made it his full-time job. You know, you think you work a lot, you work 40 days, 40 hours a week. Shaytan works day and night, so determined to lead you astray. How does he lead you astray? The Imam says he beautifies sin in your eyes. Shaitan doesn't come to you and say, drink alcohol, commit zina. He packages the sin in a way that's easy for you to justify. He beautifies it in your eyes. So this is number one, beautification of sin. And then he says, The second thing that Shaitan does is that when you commit a sin, so he beautifies the sin for you to commit it. He puts justifications in your mind to commit the sin. Now, once you commit the sin, what should you do? You should do tawbah. But shaitan puts the hope that you will one day do tawbah. So you can say that, you know, you'll do tawbah when you go to hajj. So he beautifies sin and he makes you delay tawbah. All of the tactics of shaitan boil down to these two things. Beautification of sin, postponement of toba. These are the two weapons of shaitan. And then the ayah says, ends with, فَذَرْهُمْ وَمَا يَفْتَرُونَ Ya Rasulullah, these enemies that you have, turn away from them. Leave them. Do not aggressively confront them. Why? You have to keep in mind, brothers and sisters, that we're speaking about a Meccan surah. The Muslims are vulnerable. Rasulullah is not in any position to aggressively confront these people, to fight them. He has no military power. So they're being persecuted. Allah is telling the Prophet, ignore them. Be patient. Turn away from them. Because if you confront them now, you and your followers may be annihilated. You're not ready for confrontation. Secondly, if you aggressively confront them, you'll harden their resistance to the truth. So right now you have to soften the hearts. Islam is still in, still in its infancy. You're not in a position to push people away, to embolden them against you. You're not, you don't have enough followers. You don't have the military power to resist, to fight. So turn away from them and leave them with what, with what they have invented. If we go to the next ayah, verse 113, and so the hearts of those who disbelieve in the hereafter will incline toward it, meaning toward those insinuations, towards those suggestions of the shayateen, of, the, of mankind and jinn. And so the hearts of those who disbelieve in the hereafter will incline toward it and that they will be satisfied with it and that they will earn that which they are earning now brothers and sisters allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here shares with us 
the idea that if someone doesn't believe in the Akhirah, they become very vulnerable to the whispers of the Satans, the devils among mankind, and jinn. Meaning, spiritually, you are very susceptible to deviation if you don't believe in Akhirah. Now, you may say there are many people who don't believe in the hereafter, but they're good. I agreed. Many, there are many people who don't believe in the hereafter, but they're good people. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that those people, they may be good, they may have good deeds, they may be kind-hearted people, but rejecting the hereafter makes you susceptible. It's almost as though they have a very weak spiritual immune system. They become very vulnerable to these, to these satanic inclinations. And then the Holy Quran says, because their hearts are inclined towards it, and they start to listen to these, uh, these insinuations, what happens is what was sinful becomes satisfying in their eyes. You know, brothers and sisters, over time, what is inherently repulsive, sin, becomes fair and satisfactory. You know, when you commit sin the first time, there's a bit of a shock value. Al-Iyadu Billah, if you drink alcohol the first time, the first time you commit the sin, you can feel that there is some internal agitation. But if you do it over and over and over, the shock value of sin is lost. And the sin becomes attractive to you. It becomes pleasing to you. You become satisfied with it. In the same way, if you're a smoker, if you've never smoked before and you walk into a room of smokers, you start coughing. Why are you coughing? Because you're pure. You have pure lungs. But if you're constantly sinning, if you're constantly around people who are smoking, you're always in that polluted environment, you begin to enjoy the smell. It doesn't bother you anymore because you've become accustomed to it. It, be, it has become a habit for you. So this is one of the results of persisting in sin. The sin that is inherently ugly and toxic becomes something that is fair in your eyes, something that is satisfactory to you. In verse number 114, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الْكِتَابَ مُفَصَّلًا وَالَّذِينَ آتَيْنَاهُمُ الْكِتَابَ يَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّهُ مُنَزَّلٌ مِّن رَبِّكَ بِالْحَقِّ Say, O Muhammad, then is it other than God I should seek as judge while it is he who has revealed to you the book explained in detail? And those to whom we have previously given the scripture, so do not be among the doubters. Now, the Qur'an here in this ayah and elsewhere connects proper judgment among human beings directly to sending down the book. If you go, to, for example, to Surah Al-Baqarah verse 213, you can find that there is a connection between sound judgment, proper judgment, and adherence to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now most connections between judgment and the book meaning the quran or any divine scripture you see that this is the connection however so the, the connection between proper judgment and the quran is found through many verses in the quran however these verses occur in a medani context it usually refers to verses that were revealed in medina where the Muslims have an established community, whereby if there are any disputes, they come to the Holy Prophet and they use the Qur'an as the reference to resolve their disputes. 
it, it's be, it becomes the reference for sound judgment to settle disputes. But we have to keep in mind that, again, this ayah is revealed in a Meccan context. The Sharia has not yet developed. There are very few social regulations. The, the, the fiqh just doesn't exist at this point. So what is this ayah talking about? About making Allah the judge. So the present verse occurs in a Meccan context and relates to the ongoing discussion of the Meccans' lack of acceptance and their request for a miracle. So you have to look at the siyak, the flow of the verses. So the verses, Allah is was talking about the rebellious Meccans. And the Prophet is being told that Allah is enough of a judge for me. So how does it relate to this context? The commentators of the Quran, they say that the ayah could mean that the Prophet is essentially saying, should I seek a miraculous sign apart from God's having sent down this Quran? So the Meccans are asking for proof that Rasulullah is a Prophet. They're asking for proof that the Quran is the Word of God. So the Prophet is being told that, is it other than God I should seek and judge? while it is he who has revealed to you the book, meaning you're asking me to bring down angels, you're asking me to make the dead speak, you're asking for this long list of miracles, evidentiary miracles, to substantiate my claim that this is the word of God. The Quran itself proves that it is from a divine source. The Quran doesn't need an external miracle. The Quran is a book that claims to be a miracle, and the same Qur'an that claims to be a miracle confirms that it's a miracle through itself. Because we believe that the Qur'an is the most powerful mu'jizah of the Holy Prophet. It's the most powerful evidentiary miracle. And then the ayah says, وَالَّذِينَ آتَيْنَاهُمُ الْكِتَابَ يَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّهُ مُنَزَّلٌ مِنْ رَبِّكَ Any Meccan who is sincere in their quest from the, for the truth, Qur'an should be enough for them. There's no need for me to send down angels or perform all of these miracles. Furthermore, if you want further proof that the Qur'an is the word of God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those whom, whom we have revealed previous scriptures to, Ahlul Kitab, they also know that this Quran is the word of God. Now, when you look at the Injil, now unfortunately we don't have the pure Injil among us. We don't have the 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 the, uh, the Injil that was revealed to Isa alayhi salam among us. We have perhaps fragments of it found in the New Testament. Maybe just fragments. Unfortunately, we don't have the Tawrat, the pure Tawrat that was revealed to Musa. We may have fragments of it, remnants of it in the Old Testament. But even what is among us today, because the because Torah and Injil were already adulterated at the time of the Prophet. It's not that the pure Injil existed or the pure Torah existed. They were adulterated. But there were fragments of truth in these books. And Allah is saying that even in their books, there is evidence that the Quran is the word of God. There is evidence in their books. There are descriptions in their books about the final Prophet about the advent of the Prophet. And in some of their passages, the final Prophet is even mentioned. The name of the Prophet is even mentioned. If, you know, especially some of the rabbis, some of the priests, they may have access to some old manuscripts of the Injil, some old manuscripts of the Torah. But of course, for worldly reasons, for political reasons, they don't share it with the masses. If you go to Surat Yunus, verse 94, 
Allah says, فَإِنْ كُنْتَ فِي شَكٍ If you are in doubt, مِمَّا أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ If you are in doubt about what we have revealed to you, Allah is speaking to the Prophet. But of course the Prophet doesn't have any doubt. He's speaking to the, to the believers, to the community. Because the, the Holy Prophet is the primary addressee and he's the head of the community of the believers. If you have any doubt that what we have revealed is from God, الكتاب, ask those who read the book. Ask the Jews, ask the Christians, ask their scholars who are familiar with the scriptures. فَاسْأَلِ الَّذِينَ يَقْرَؤُونَ الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِكْ لَقَدْ جَاءَكَ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكْ Indeed, the truth has come to you from your Lord. In verse number 115, وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ صِدْقًا وَعَدْلًا لَا مُبَدِّلًا لِكَلِمَاتِهِ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِينَ And the word of your Lord has been fulfilled in truth and in justice. None can alter his words, and he is the hearing, the all-knowing. Now, when Allah says, وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ And the word of your Lord has been fulfilled. The completion of God's word, according to some commentators of the Qur'an, refers to the completion of his guidance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is essentially telling the Prophet that, Ya Rasulullah, don't let these kuffar, these mushrikeen discourage you. Even though they're fighting to extinguish the light of this Qur'an, the Qur'an, my system of guidance will be fulfilled. My word will be fulfilled. Every verse that I intend upon, intend to reveal will be revealed in due time. The completion of my guidance to humankind will be fulfilled. There are many satanic winds that will try to extinguish the light of my guidance, but I will make sure that it is preserved. And this is a similar message that is echoed in Surah at tawbah Surah number 9, verse 32, where Allah says, يُرِيدُونَ أَن يُطْفِئُوا نُورَ اللَّهِ بِأَفْوَاهِهِمْ وَيَأْضَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا أَن يُتِمَّ نُورَهُ وَلَوْ كَرِهَ الْكَافِرُونَ they, they try, they, they, they desire to extinguish the light of God with their mouths. But Allah insists on perfecting His light, even if it angers, even if the disbelievers don't like that. So, وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ صِدْقًا وَعَدْلًا the word of your Lord will be fulfilled. The system of guidance will be completed. Not only will the Quran be delivered, not only will God's final message reach humanity, but Allah promises that this Quran will not be tampered with. It will not be adulterated. Allah never made that promise with respect to the Injil. He never made that promise with respect to the Torah. But Allah is giving His guarantee that this final testament, you know, the Old Testament was corrupted. The New Testament was distorted. But the Qur'an is the final testament and it has the divine guarantee that it will not be adulterated. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His commandments represent perfect justice. Allah says, وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ صِدْقًا وَعَدْلًا And it will not be adulterated. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Hijj, Surah 15 verse 9, again He gives this guarantee. إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا الذِّكْرِ We have revealed to you the reminder. وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ And we will guard it. We will protect it from distortion. Verse 116. وَإِن تُطِعِ وَإِن تُطِعِ أَكْثَرَ مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ يُضِلُّوكَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ إِنْ يَتَّبِعُونَ إِلَّا الظَّنْ وَإِنْ هُمْ إِلَّا يَخْرُصُونَ And if you obey, 
Ya Rasulullah. And if you obey most of those upon the earth, they will mislead you from the way of from the way of God. They follow nothing except assumption. And they are now they are they are not they are nothing but falsifiers. This is an important verse of the Holy Quran, brothers and sisters, because people have this idea that the majority, a numerical majority is an indicator of truth you know for example they see are most people following this way if they see there are many following this path they assume that this much this must be the correct road this must be the path that leads to salvation and prosperity only because of the majority whereas the allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the prophet that if you follow the majority of what people say, they will lead you astray. They will lead you astray. Throughout history, subhanAllah, it's always been the minority who have been right. The minority have been the ones who are on the path of truth. If you go back from the time of Adam, Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, if you look at all of these communities, it's always the believers who are the minority and the disbelievers, the corrupt, the wicked, they constitute the majority. This is why in the hadith, Imam Amir al Mu'mineen, salawatullahi alayhi, he gives us a very important piece of advice. He says, La tastawhishu tariq al haq li qillati saliki. The Imam alayhi salam, he says, Don't feel lonely when you're on the path of truth because of the scarcity of those who are taking that path. Don't say that, oh, there's only a few people, a handful of people that are taking this path. The Imam says, don't feel lonely. As long as you are on the path of truth, don't let the numbers discourage you. Don't let the numbers discourage you. Verse 117, إِنَّ رَبَّكَ هُوَ أَعْلَمُ مَنْ يَضِلُّ عَنْ Indeed, your Lord knows best those who stray from his path, and he knows best those who are on the right path, on the path of guidance. People don't know. People are going to assume that, you know, whichever religion has the majority of the followers, that must be the, the religion of truth. Allah says, I am the one who knows who's on the straight path. If you were to go back to the time of Ibrahim, Ibrahim alayhi salam, the overwhelming majority of his community, they were pagans. In fact, Ibrahim was probably the only monotheist. Everyone else was mushrik. If you were to ask most people in this society, in Babylon, who should we follow? Should we follow, you know, Namrud and his aides and his entourage? Or, or should we follow the lonely Ibrahim? Most people would say, go with, the, go with the flow. Follow the masses. Follow the majority. But the truth was with Ibrahim. The truth was with that one man. That's why Allah in the Quran, He says, Inna Ibrahim, inna Ibrahim, kana ummatan. Ibrahim was one man, but Allah calls him a nation. He was one man, but he's a nation in, in his influence, in his spiritual power. The rest of them, the thousands, the millions, they're nothing. They're like a big bubble. You know, one little poke and you pop them all. They're weak. Inna Ibrahim akana umma. Ibrahim was a nation in and of himself. Verse 118. So eat of that meat upon which the name of God has been mentioned, if you are believers in his signs. Now, this may seem like a very strange transition. We go from speaking about, you know, the Holy Prophet's conversation with the Kuffar about proving his nubuwa, proving that the Quran is the word of God, you know, commands to go and talk to the people of the book as supporting evidence that the Quran is the word of God. 
don't follow you know the whims of the people because they'll lead you astray don't think about numbers when it comes to your pursuit of the truth and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says do not eat meat upon which my name is not invoked what's the connection it may seem like just a totally random topic that's being introduced now the idea here is up until this point many of the the, the verses that we've covered speak about tawheed speak about God's oneness speak about belief in the hereafter so many of the verses that we've been discussing revolve around aqeedah aqaid beliefs but here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us a practical instruction and the idea here is belief needs to be translated into observable action what's the point of imam if it's not going to have an effect on your behavior and imam people of faith it needs to have such a profound impact on their lifestyle that even the way they eat differs from the way that other people eat you see the message here that iman faith has to have an effect on your actions it should even have an effect on your diet this is how important it is for us to, to nurture our souls everything that you do has an effect on your soul everything that you say everything that you look at everything that you listen to and everything that you consume has an effect on your spirituality so everything so, so the verses before i number 118 many of them at least were speaking about belief refining our beliefs acquiring a correct belief system now here are some practical applications now that you have a proper belief system it has to be reflected in your actions and one of the ways iman is reflected in your actions is that you have to pay attention to what you consume, what you eat. Allah says, فَكُلُوا مِمَّا ذُكِرَ اسْمُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ Eat, now, kulu is a commanding verb. Now, but this doesn't mean that it's wajib for you to eat meat. Yes, even though maybe some people would like to have that type of wujub. Allah is not saying that it's wajib. Here, the command, فَكُلُوا indicates permissibility it's permissible for you to eat meat upon which the name of god is mentioned in kuntum bi mu'minin if you are truly believers this is what you should do meaning it should be reflected in your actions now if you go to the next verse verse 119 وَمَا لَكُمْ أَلَّا تَأْكُلُوا مِمَّا ذُكِرَ اسْمُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَقَدْ فَصَّلَ لَكُمْ مَا حَرَّمَ عَلَيْكُمْ إِلَّا مَضْضُرِرْتُمْ إِلَيْهِ وَإِنَّ كَثِيرًا لِيُضِلُّونَ بِأَهْوَائِهِمْ بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ إِنَّ رَبَّكَ هُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِالْمُحْتَدِينَ And why should you not eat of that upon which the name of God has been mentioned? while he has explained in detail to you what he has forbidden you except accepting that to which you are compelled and indeed many lead others astray through their own inclination without knowledge indeed your lord is best aware of the transgressors now the reason why these verses have been revealed now keep in mind this is a meccan surah and there's a lot of friction between the believers and the pagans the pagans are doing everything that they can to to persuade the believers and even other people that this religion is a religion of nonsense now what was happening in mecca is that the pagans they would say to the prophet and even some of the Zoroastrians, people of other faith traditions, 
They were saying to the Prophet that what kind of religion is this? You're telling us that meat, an animal that dies naturally, an animal whom God killed, is their exact wording, it's forbidden for us to eat, but an animal that human beings kill and they mention God's name, that's that meat is permissible for us to consume? So they were making these ridiculous arguments. They were saying that, Ya Rasul, O Muhammad, what kind of nonsense is this? If God kills an animal, if you find a carcass in the middle of a desert, it dies. God was the one who killed it and ended its life. You're telling us that meat from an animal whom God made die is not permissible for us to eat, it's haram. But the meat that human beings kill and mention God's name, that's permissible. So it created a lot of fitna, a lot of confusion. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, I have described in detail what I have forbidden. Now in Surah Al-Ma'idah, there are many verses that speak about the dietary restrictions that, that's imposed upon the mu'mineen. But again, this is a Meccan surah. Surah Al-Ma'idah was revealed later on. Some commentators say that the detail that Allah is mentioning here, that I have already explained to you in detail what I have forbidden, refers to Surah Al-Nahal, Surah 16, verses 114 and 115. So you can refer to that ayah where Allah gives a little bit more detail about what types of meat are forbidden for believers to eat. Now because the sharia is, is easy and Allah wishes ease upon us, Allah says, listen, there are certain circumstances, that, certain situations where you're forced, you have no choice but to consume haram. You know, the example that everybody gives, you know, you're stranded, you have no other food supply, the only thing that you have, you know, is a Big Mac. You know, I don't know, this is probably never going to happen, but people always use this example. You're stuck in the middle of the desert, you have nothing but vodka and pork. You know, it's a very weird example, but if you're compelled, you're, you're permitted. If you are coerced, you know, sometimes you might be imprisoned. This may happen. You're imprisoned, and they give you no food, you know, just to kind of, you know, insult you. They give you no food except pork and wine. You know, there are some people who are like that. They know that the believers don't consume certain types of meat, that consumption of alcohol is haram. It could be that some people, they, they imprison a mu'min, and the only food that they allow them to consume is haram. Allah says, if you're compelled, you are pardoned. وَإِنَّ كَثِيرًا لَيُضِلُّونَ بِأَهْوَائِهِمْ that indeed many lead others astray through their own inclination without knowledge. That argument that they made, that an animal that God kills is forbidden for us to eat, but an animal that human beings kill, when they mention God's name is permissible for us to eat. Allah says these people, they're, they're speaking without knowledge. They're, they're leading other people astray without knowledge. إِنَّ رَبَّكَ هُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِالْ Mu'tadeen. Verse 120. And leave what is apparent of sin and what is concealed thereof. Indeed, those who earn sin will be awarded that which they earned. Now, many people avoid sin mainly in public domains you know if you have a sin a habit that you you know you have a sin a sinful habit well, perhaps you're going to avoid that sin in public because a sin in public is seen as a greater abomination than a sin in private allah says you need to avoid both sins you need to avoid both sins because Allah is with you in public and in private. In the, in the spiritual world, there's no such thing as privacy. Even, even if you close the door and you're sitting alone in your room and there's no one for miles, not only are 
you being witnessed by Allah. Not, not only is Allah a witness, there are malaika who are there. Your own limbs are testifying against you. The earth that you are sitting on or standing on is a witness. So even when you're in the privacy of your own home, when there's no one around you, there's no such thing as privacy. Allah sees you. Malaika see you. It's amazing that we avoid sins in public because we're embarrassed of people. How about malaika? How about angels? How about God himself? How about your limbs? How about the earth? The earth has consciousness, has awareness. That's why in the Quran, on the Day of Judgment, what does Allah say? In Surah Al-Zalzala, إِذَا زُلْزِلَةِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَهَا وَأَخْرَجَةِ الْأَرْضُ أَثْقَالَهَا وَقَالَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا لَهَا يَوْمَئِذٍ تُحَدِّثُ أَخْبَارًا The earth will speak. It will testify against those who committed acts of transgression because the earth witnessed those acts of transgression that were committed on it. Now, when it comes to apparent sins and hidden sins, some scholars have said that apparent sins are sins that are committed with your limbs. You know, you drink alcohol, you know, you raise the glass with your hand and you consume it with your mouth, with your limbs. These are, as the Quran says, ظاهر الإث, apparent sins. The sins that are hidden, that are batin, are the sins of the heart, some scholars say. So you have sins of the limbs, which are the apparent sins, and then you have sins of the heart. Sins of the heart are rejecting God's existence. That's a sin of the heart. Losing hope in Allah's mercy is a sin of the heart. So you have some sins that are sins of the limbs, and you have other sins that are sins of the heart. Allah says you need to avoid both of them because both of them are destructive to the soul. Verse 121. And and do not eat of that upon which the name of God has not been mentioned, for indeed it is a sinful act. And indeed the devils inspire their allies to dispute with you. As I mentioned, they were disputing with the Prophet, mocking the Prophet, saying an animal that God kills is haram for us to consume, but an animal that human beings kill and mention God's name is permissible. What type of nonsense is this? Allah says they inspire each other to dispute against the messenger of god now allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls the act of consuming haram food haram meat as a sinful act something that damages the soul and i'll conclude with this hadith from imam zainul abidin salawatullahi alayhi where he says luqma to haramin luqma means a morsel a small morsel of unlawful food has a very negative effect even in dunya. Forget about the punishment in the hereafter. Imam Zainul Abidin, he says, consuming a morsel, a small amount of haram food blocks your dua from being from being answered for 40 days you know people they come they say sheikh how come allah doesn't answer my dua meanwhile he's slamming burgers at mcdonald's every day right <inaudible> the, the effect of your prayer is diminished because of the consumption of haram we ask allah azza wa jal to make us people who are conscious of what we put inside of our bodies because it has an impact on our souls. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to enlighten our hearts with the nur of the Holy Quran. We have a few minutes for uh, for questions and answers. I apologize. I think my my daughter is screaming her head off, so I don't have that much time for Q&A, but a few questions. 
if there are some. Any questions or comments? Why is there has always been so much emphasis on eating her? And you just mentioned it that even a small a morsel. So I just I'm wondering why there's so much emphasis on uh, during something that's her. You know, we, we don't know why there are some some sins that have a more damaging effect than others. The reality is we don't know why. But we, what we do know is that the soul is incredibly sensitive. And I'll give you a very simple example. Now, when, you, when you're on wudu, when you're in a state of tahara, spiritually you are in a state that you can enter into a formal prayer with Allah. You can do your salah. You need to be in a state of wudu, state of tahara, to do your prayers. If you, if you go to sleep, Stay you're in a state of tahara, you did your wudu, and you go, you, you fall in, you take a nap, you go into a deep sleep. When you wake up, can you pray? Or do you have to do wudu? You have to do wudu. Did you commit a sin? Is sleeping a sin? No. You performed a very natural bodily function, which is to sleep. But sleep, Put your soul in a state whereby it needs wudu to become ready for that formal ibadah. Imagine, look at this, how sensitive the soul is. Going into a deep sleep has an effect on your soul, whereby you need to do wudu to enter into a formal communion with Allah called your salah. Imagine actually committing a sin, what, what happens to you? You see? You know, going to the bathroom, it's a natural bodily function. But it has an effect on your soul, whereby you're not, you're not, your soul is not in a position to enter, to perform certain acts of worship. It needs to be primed. It needs to engage in a preparatory exercise to prepare it for that worship. Just like when you go to the gym, you know, especially when you, when you get older, you need to stretch before you begin your workout. Otherwise, you're going to pull a muscle. Your body's not ready for a rigorous workout without stretching, right? When you want to speak to Allah formally through salah, you need to be prepared for that formal communication. So again, this is an indication that the soul is very sensitive, very delicate. You know, when you go outside and it's a very cold day, you make sure to bundle up, you put, you know, a hat on, you wear warm clothes, because your body, you don't want to expose your body to the elements because you, you might get sick. You take a lot of precautionary measures. The soul is even more sensitive than the body, whereby even natural bodily functions introduces a type of darkness into the soul that can, that can only be eradicated through wudu, tahara, these rituals. So we don't know why certain actions have more of a negative effect on the soul than others. This is why, this is why we need revelation. This is why the human intellect is very limited. It can only take you so far, and then revelation takes us the rest of the way. Uh, Any other questions or comments? Yeah, so in uh, verse 112, what does turn away from them and leave them mean in a practical sense? Like how, what was it advocating for like complete, the prophet to completely disassociate with them until they come to him or what? what? So as I mentioned in, in the last session, when, when the Quran is telling the prophet, to leave them and turn away from them. Now, it doesn't mean that he abandons his mission and doesn't preach to them anymore. No, Rasulullah is the, the Prophet has a duty. He has a duty to guide. And sometimes the people that you're trying to guide are obnoxious. You know, just like you know, you know, teachers can probably relate to this. Sometimes, you know, you're a teacher, you have to educate all of your students. Sometimes you have rude, you have rowdy students. Allah is telling the Prophet, turn away from them. Meaning that don't let them discourage you. 
you know, don't pay too much attention to their insults and their mockery. Don't let that make you lose focus of your primary objective, which is to guide. Don't confront them. Mean, don't in this case, don't aggressively confront them, because as I mentioned, number one, you you just you know you don't have the number. You don't have the foot soldiers. You're not in a position to can aggressively confront the likes of Abu Sufyan, Abu Jahl, and these individuals. You know, you're still, you only have a handful of followers, and your followers are scattered. Many of them went to Abyssinia. Others are preparing hijrah to Medina. You're in a very vulnerable state. You're not in a position to fight. Now, Islam says that if you're being attacked, you have a right to defend yourself. But even Allah, Allah is not even giving the Prophet the permission to defend himself militarily it's not the time allah subhanahu wa ta'ala later on second year after the hijrah he gives him permission to defend himself against those who are persecuting him so islam is still in its infancy the prophet is still vulnerable the muslim community is still weak and also resisting them this early on will only make the enemies more bitter it will embolden them. It will harden their resistance. So the timing is not right. All right. Thank you very much, Shaykh. This was highly educational. As thank always. you so much. May Allah bless you. And uh, inshallah, I pray that you guys are all well. And I see you, inshallah, next week on Tuesday, same time. Inshallah, yes. May Allah bless you. As-salamu alaykum.